Firstly, I'd really like to thank um, Water Sense of SA for inviting me to come down here. It's a real privilege, and so I hope I'll entertain you and, and, and possibly even enlighten you, but I'm sure we'll, I'll be enlightened as well from the conversation afterwards. So I just wanted to start by giving a bit of context about South East Queensland. Probably like Adelaide, uh, it's, growing, it's growing very quickly. Um, we're expecting in the next 20 years to get about around about 700 or a bit more thousand houses built in South East Queensland. Um, the rest of coastal Queensland, we're expecting to see kind of similar numbers, um, maybe 500,000 homes across the reef region in the next 20 years. So lots of homes are being built, lots of areas are being converted from grazing or even forest to urban. Um, and so that sets the context for the opportunity. Um, so more broadly, um, what are we trying to achieve by actually, when I talk about water sensitive urban design, probably I'm talking mainly about water quality at this stage, but we'll, I'll broaden the discussion afterwards. So we're trying to achieve some things for the residents of South East Queensland that really are meaningful for them. Um, so obviously people um, really value the natural habitats that South East Queensland offers that, and, Queens, and coastal Queensland, like the reef, like Moreton Bay, like our, like our creeks and estuaries and beaches. So they really value that. Um, so they want them to be intact for their ecological value. Um, they want them to be intact because they get economic productivity out of those ecosystems. So we have a really good um, seafood industry. Um, tour tourism's big our water supply comes from the Brisbane River, from the upper part of the Brisbane River. Um, and um, the only, actually the only time, interestingly, that, that's been, we've had a real problem with water shortage. We had a drought uh, in, the, in the noughties, um, or from the 90s into the noughties. Um, up until we had a flood in 2011, as made national news. But the actual, the, the time that we became closest to running out of water as a city in Brisbane was when we had a flood. So we had um, water coming down the river that was brown and they had to turn the treatment plant off. So um, actually that, that's kind of an irony about the, the climate that we live in. Um, and also people value um, for recreation um, and also getting out and engaging with waterways and planting trees and stuff like that. People get a lot of value out of doing that, so we're trying to harness all of those things. So, so for us up in Queensland, when I talk about water sensitive urban design, most people interpret that as stormwater quality. So we talk about water sensitive urban design, most people talk about bioretention, wetlands, a bit stormwater harvesting, not so much as here, um, um, swales, that kind of infrastructure, that's people's thinking. So water sensitive urban design is really water quality infrastructure, water quantity infrastructure is a bit, but that's sort of considered flooding. So. Just to give you a bit of context about when we talk about water sensitive urban design, that's mainly what we're talking about. For me, it's, a bit, it's bigger and broader. Um, water sensitive urban design is, a, is, are, is really principles to help us achieve really good urban areas um, that offer value to the people who live there and also protect the environment at the same time. So just as we go through, you'll see that it's a focus on stormwater quality and that's, that's why. Um, so where I'm coming from too is, um, collaboration um, being really important. So we, we heard about the Water Sensitive SA Steering Committee and the collaboration that's involved there. Um, I work with lots of different stakeholders. So I work for Healthy Waterways and um, it's, it's uh, got a, an SEQ focus. Um, so in SEQ there's about three and a half million people. In the rest of the state um, there's not that many, right? So there's about one, one and a half million people. So there's very much a focus on SEQ in Queensland. That gives you a bit of context as well. So the really nice group of people who make up a sort of a collective of people from councils um, across the reef region, it's called the Reef Urban Stormwater Management Improvement Group. And that's affectionately known as RUSMIG. Um, and Ru that's Healthy Waterways First, but RUSMIG is just the, one of the, I don't know, possibly one of the worst acronyms <laughs> ever. I don't know, RUSMIG, it sounds like some sort of Russian fighter jet, but, um, <laughs> um, but it's a good organisation. So is Healthy Waterways. Um, Healthy Waterways has been around for 20 years. Um, it was very informal in the beginning. Um, a, gr a group of scientists said, we need to, we need to change something. Um, wastewater's not getting treated. Um, we, need to do, we need to do a lot better. So it was that evidence-based evidence policy was kind of the agenda early on. Um, recently, so last year, we changed our vision. So you'll see the vision, um, healthy waterways for a healthy economy. Um, and that's very deliberate because we're f we were finding, in, particularly in Queensland and the context we were in, but also more broadly, that if you don't speak in terms of economics, um, it's really hard to get anywhere. It's really hard, not only, just, not only to get money, but just to make any progress, just to get people to listen. So um, we changed our focus, and that's actually working really well. We're, we're, we're connecting with more organisations than we've been able to previously. Um, and so our purpose is, 
We've got a, so if, for those of you who are aware, Healthy Waterways has a report card that's been going for 15 years, and so we report on the, on the health of the waterways, and so they, we give each waterway a grade, and that's sort of what it's, what it's well known for. And it can be really controversial. I mean, so some, some waterways, like Brisbane, get a D minus or an F almost every year, and they say, oh, we're sick of being smacked around. And so Healthy Waterways, about 10 years ago, decided we need to, we need to start creating some tools and resources to help the local governments, particularly in the state government, actually make actually do stuff because we're just beating them around and not giving them any solutions. Um, so the the members are, are broad. Um, it's all of the local governments in SEQ, the state government, um, our um, our local um, NRM group, um, SQ catchments, um, the water utilities, and also the universities are all members. So it's that it's a very close connection with science. So it's similar in theme to how the water sensitive SA is, is going to be working. So one early success that, that Healthy Waterways and the report card had was, was a drive to do better sewage treatment. Um, so it was, really, uh, it was really science that drove a really big investment. Um, so about a billion dollars, I think it was actually more, was invested in um, point source pollution abatement, so upgrading sewage treatment plants or actually putting in sewage treatment plants in some instances. Um, we had, and, th and that was a driver because we were getting lingvia bloom. So lingvia is a, a toxic um, algae that, that was growing in Moreton Bay. And so people were getting, like it, it burns. It's quite, um, it's quite an irritating. Um, and so that irritant created a political irritant. Um, and then we, that created the, the drive to, to do something. And that's, so we learned something from that as well. So Water by Design, as I, as I mentioned, was, was um, formed as a response. We need to help particularly local government to do, st so we're asking them to manage stormwater quality. We identified some, some of the impacts on waterways. So we have point source solution. We felt like we were dealing with that pretty well. Um, we have stormwater pollution. And there's other, other kinds of pollution, but stormwater pollution, that's something we can actually do. We can actually build infrastructure. We need to help people to do that. Um, so our, our purpose has actually shifted over the, over the last 10 years. It, it was very much early on develop capacity. So develop technical capacity, train people, teach them how to do it. Um, but it's become much more focused on institutional capacity, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but um, helping people to collaborate. It sounds like it should just happen, but we all know that it's, it's actually really hard. Um, so that's, that's our focus. Again, our focus is a lot of focus still on stormwater. That's, that's still a big focus because we're still, we've still got some ground to make. Construction site management, I don't know how, how you go with construction sites here. Um, it's, it's abysmal in Queensland as well. So. Um, we get about, we've got policy, we've got this, a state government policy, Environmental Protection Act. Um, you're not allowed to discharge dirty water from construction sites, but about 5% are compliant. So, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really bad. So we've got a lot of ground to make up there. And we also do some work with point source solution because there's obviously a connection when you talk about integrated water management. There's obviously, there's, there's wins you can make by connecting the dots. So we've, we're knowing we've got lots of guidelines, lots of training packages, stuff like that. So we've got all that. Um, but more recently we've been doing projects, so working on not consultancy projects but working with consultants. So we, we, get, we get our members to invest in projects and then we get really good consultants involved with us and we deliver collaborative projects with, um, with government. Um, and we, we've got a steering committee too. Um, all the members have an opportunity to be members of the part of the steering committee, so we've got about 20 people on the steering committee. Um, it's fantastic to have such a big group but it's really challenging because there's lots of different views. Um, so sometimes we have to say, hey, look, we can't do that. So this thing that you want to do, we, 18 people want to do it, want to do this other thing. So there's, there's definite challenges managing a big group like that. So RUSMIG, um, it's actually a very organic collective of people from local government mainly, but NRM groups as well from the reef region got together and decided we need to do better with stormwater management. Um, and so they meet very informally. Um, um, Every, you know, I think between 2009, 2012, 13, they met about three times. Um, in 2013, 14, we met a number of times, and I'll talk about that in a second. Again, it's also NRM groups and the, the, the state government and local councils who are members. It's a very informal collective. It's very effective, though. Um, we, um, we wrote a grant um, uh, and got some, was successful in getting some funding for, uh, under the, the federal government's Reef Rescue Program. So we got $850,000, which was pretty welcome, to be honest, um, because we had, a, we had a lot of ideas of projects we wanted to do for a number of years, and we d this was our chance to, to kind of do them. Um, 
So we did. We got very. We were very, very busy. We did 15 projects. We had to do it in about nine months. This is that federal government funding cycle, and this is the peakiness of. This is the problem too with capacity building programs. They're very peaky funding, so sometimes you have very little or nothing to, to work with, and sometimes you have an awful lot of money. So you have to be ready to deal with having nothing and what you can do in that context, and also having a fair bit of money to deliver projects. You've got to be ready to to roll out programs, and 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 we were luckily. So we did a lot of a lot of good stuff. Um, just a bit about collaboration. Um, it's not, it, it, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a buzzword. Everyone's, it's very magical. Like, it's really nice to collaborate. Everyone uses the word collaboration a lot. Um, and so, sometimes you don't need to collaborate. Sometimes you, you know what you need to do. You just, you just go off and do it. Like, that's, that's my advice. So if you know what you need to do and you've got a job to do, then you should do it. But th it's very rare that you shouldn't be talking to someone else about pretty much anything. So I'd say that there's always a really good, um, opportunity to collaborate even if you don't think it's needed. But the reason that we do it um, is because it actually, it saves our members money because they all chip in a bit, so that's the obvious one. Everyone chips in a bit, they all need something, everyone chips in a bit and then they save because if 10 people chip in, they pay one tenth. Um, you mightn't get exactly what you, what you want because you've got to share the outcome with a lot of other people, but we find that by doing that, we actually, the program's better. So. It's a bit more tricky to deliver because you've got different aspects, but you get a better product. So that would be my, my take home from that. And also, it's a, it's a way of getting funding. So um, that's important for a capacity building program because it's hard to get funding. It's hard to get funding to, build, to do capacity building. Um, it's easy to get funding to do projects. Um, so I just wanted to tell a bit of a story about where we've come from. So I, I sort of, when I was thinking about this, um, I reckon there's been sort of five phases. Um, you, you could break it to three, but I decided on five because it was made a better story, I thought. Um, so that's the, that's the plume, the flood plume that was in Moreton Bay after the flood in 2011. Um, and that wasn't a driver for policy, but certainly um, Moreton Bay is a driver for creating policy in southeast Queensland and the reef um, more broadly in Queensland. Um, and local waterways have a lower priority which is kind of interesting, um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. So in Queensland, we have the Sustainable Planning Act, which um, is the, the legislation around development, so all development. So councils um, can require things to happen through that. Um, the Environmental Protection Water Policy then got taken, so key parts of that got picked up in a water quality component in our state planning policy, and state planning policy is something that, that, that local governments need to pick up into their development plans, you call them in South Australia, development plans. So essentially what the state's doing is saying, local governments, you need to do this, in short. Um, you need to make developers do this, and we kind of want you to do it on your own projects too. Um, those requirements are, again, erosion sediment control, it's mentioned again, so it's in the Environmental Prote Protection Act and the state planning policy. It's, that still doesn't happen, so we've asked for it twice, and we, we figure, well, let's ask for it maybe three times, lucky, I don't know. Um, uh, it's very, very challenging to get that to happen, erosion sediment control. Um, so we've got uh, two different types of quantitative stormwater objectives. We've got the, the quantity component and a quality component. So the quantity component that we have left in our policy is a waterway stability objective, which is to preserve the one-year flow in, in the waterway, the flow and velocity. So it's to protect the stream. The intention is to protect the stream from erosion, whether it does that or not. I think it, it's... it's it's probably, I think, the science is pre, pretty supportive, that that's a good objective for that, for, for, um, to achieve that outcome. Um, load reduction objectives. Um, are, so for those of you who don't know, um, when you talk about load reduction, that's you put a development on the ground, it's 80% reduction if you, as if you've done nothing. So it's the unmitigated to the mitigated case is a percent reduction. Um, the problem we find with that is that it drives infrastructure. So that doesn't actually drive any avoidance. So any really good design to avoid an impact in the first place, because if you have a higher level of um, imperviousness, you have a higher pollution generation, then it's easier to achieve a load reduction. So you tend to want to create a huge amount of pollution and then reduce it. So does that make sense? And that's a bit frustrating for us because it, that's quite costly. Like you don't, you'd rather just avoid the impact in the first place because that's quite cheap. But there's no, we, it's really hard to make objectives that actually, I'll talk about that later, but it's really hard to make objectives that actually drive that behaviour. 
we had a frequent fly management objective, and the purpose of that was to um, protect in-stream habitat, so the, 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 the frequency, the little washout of, of bugs and critters and stuff in waterways. Um, and the objective was set as to capture the first 15 millimetres of runoff, it's an awful lot of water, um, and remove it within 24 hours. So that was through harvesting or infiltration or evaporation. Um, the problem was it was actually really, technically it was really hard to comply with. Um, it was really hard to demonstrate compliance if you did. Um, there was a bit of mixed scientific evidence that it would actually work. Um, and the last thing was it, was it didn't really seem to be ever applied. Nobody ever seemed to manage to, to pull it together and, and, and do it. So subsequently it was actually taken out of the SPP. Um, temporarily, I think, I think, I think hydrologic or low flow hydrologic, hydrologic objectives will come, they'll make a, a comeback. But we need a bit more local waterway science to prove it. I think that's the, the, the lesson we learned there. Now this is a really interesting one. Um, we also had in our Queensland Development Code, which is the code for buildings, um, a requirement for water savings targets. And that, that became known as the rainwater tank policy because a really easy way to comply with that policy was to put a rainwater tank on every single house. Um, and so it, as a, a code, so uh, a way you could achieve it was to put a five kilolitre rainwater tank, um, plumb it up to the roof, then plumb it into, um, or connect to the roof, plumb it into an outdoor tap, a toilet and your, your cold water laundry and you're done. You achieve that part of that code. Unfortunately, what happened was um, it was quite unpopular with builders um, because I don't think it was necessarily, I don't think it was actually necessarily the money. I think it was just, my opinion is that it was just an extra thing they had to do that they didn't really want to do. Um, uh, and they produced, uh, had, had a paper produced that was influential enough to have that policy removed. So um, we don't have a requirement, for the state doesn't have a requirement for rainwater tanks now. Um, now local governments are trying to do it, but it's actually really, what's, what's proving quite difficult is that the state have said, Local governments have to apply to us to make people have rainwater tanks because the building industry said, don't let them do it, don't let the local governments work around us because we don't want rainwater tanks because they're costing us money and it's housing affordability and this kind of story. Um, I, I don't really, I, don't, I think rainwater tanks are really good, um, we're really good in Queensland, it was working, um, we, were, we were getting them on the ground and it was saving developers money. So what actually happened was, as soon as the rainwater tanks got removed from, the, from that code, Council started sending plans back to the engineers say, redesign your bioretention basins, they need to be 50% bigger. And that's happening. So, they, so it's cost, the cost was then shifted back to the developer and the developer didn't have space. So they hadn't made space for that because they had had, had, had preliminary pr plans approved. And, and so this created a really, a, a whole heap of tension between councils, it's not their fault, because they'd approved plans in, with, with an assumption about rainwater tanks being present and they got taken away, so it's not their fault. They're not getting the outcomes they're after. So the designers in good faith have come up with plans that had rainwater tanks. It's not their fault. And the, the developers, not their fault either. I mean, they've, you know, and so th this, is, this is what happens. So this is what happens if decisions are made without thinking about the flow on effects, pardon the pun. So what we learned there is um, we weren't really, we weren't really ahead of that rainwater tank. We, we actually made a really red hot go to have rainwater tanks retained. We, had, we did, did put a lot of effort in but we weren't successful. Um, possibly we, we, if we'd been early, earlier into the fray we might have been able to influence a bit but I think it was, um, there was a very much a political um, wave moving in that direction at that time. We'd had a new government come in, a quite a conservative government, Campbell Newman's government came in and their wave was reducing green tape. That was the green tape reduction thing was a big thing. Um, and so despite not having a really good evidence base for removing rainwater tanks, they were removed. So that, that we were sort of, okay, so policy can be changed without evidence. That's not really the way we'd like to see things happen. And we also had to be prepared to, to let things go where we, didn't, where we felt like we didn't really have the evidence because that, otherwise we could be seen to be sort of, you know, being um, unrealistic. So, we, so the frequent flow management objective was one where we, it was really hard for us to, to justify it because we didn't have all the science, everything wasn't lined up. And so when the pressure was on, we said, we have to, we have to let that one go for now b until we get better science. That was a hard one. Um, so then we got into this phase of, right, we need to teach people how to do it. So we need to train people. 
Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick, this is how our development process works. It's probably similar. Um, we, um, people probably don't always go to the site to check it out, but a concept plan is, is produced and a stormwater management plan is submitted to, to council. And then that gets approved, invariably approved. I mean, they never get, as far as I can tell, they never get rejected, um, the really bad ones. Um, so then design happens, design drawings happen, and there's an, then those plans are then lodged again. And that's when the rainwater tank thing got picked up in Queensland, that those detailed design drawings then get handed in, and it's, everything's locked in at that point. Um, and then well, we don't have rainwater tanks, now you've got to make that bigger. So now I'm going to lose, lose lots, and that's a housing affordability issue for a developer. They're saying, now I'm going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, then we have construction and... and, and um, the development goes through, the assets are then handed over to um, the council by the developer at some point, and then I put maintenance there. I don't really see much maintenance happening, so um, it should though, um, but that's a, really big, that's a really big problem actually in Queensland at the moment. And a driver to stop actually is the maintenance problem. So we've got heaps of guidelines. Um, so yep, we can tell people, we tell people what to do in every part of that system, and it actually it helps, it, I must say it helps a lot but it's not everything. So um, I, I probably thought, well, once we teach people, um, I probably had this naive assumption that once we teach people how to do it, it'll be fine. It'll, all, it'll happen. It doesn't happen necessarily. Um, and one little perverse outcome that can happen is the really, really good operators, those really innovative lead, leading edge people, they can get a bit held back by these because they get used as standards. Um, they're not meant to be standards. I think they're called, yeah, they're called guidelines, yep. Um, they're guidelines and they're meant to be used as guidance for people who don't really know or who need help to get up to speed. For those innovative people who want to stretch and go a bit further, we're, we're, we're getting some feedback from councils that, that they were getting held back. No, no, we don't want to do that because the guidelines say this. So we've got to work with our organisations and our institutions to help them so they don't do that. Um, so when we talk about capacity building program, I'm sure that... Um, I don't, I don't need to talk to you guys about this too much, but it isn't just, so I talked about professional development there. There's a lot of different components um, and you need to do all of them at all times. And it's, that's really tricky, I must say. Um, we've had a bit of a focus on this one more recently. So directive reforms, this, re this refers to policy um, and facilitate, facilitative reforms. So we're, we're, we're focusing much more effort now on strengthening our organisations and working on incentives and other things to help people do it rather than making them do it. Because we've got the policy to make them do it. That's really important. You need that. So you can have incentives and you can have strong organisations and you can have champions, but if without a policy, nothing happens. Um, that's really a really important lesson. Um, we're also trying to bring everything together. So we're trying to, rather than just have a guideline, a training package, a thing here and there, we're trying to integrate our tools and resources so that people can go to one place and pick it all up. So we've developed, like everyone else, we've developed an app. There it is. That's, and so you can, so with construction, we're finding that um, people didn't really know, the, the guys who were building it, they didn't really know. We had, these we had eight checklists for building a bioretention basin. Do you think anyone ever filled them in? Oh, I did before, because I thought that was great. That really helped. But very rarely it gets done. And so it was a bit, we realised it was, we were getting sort of, when people were doing it, it was that 95-5 rule. We get, had about five people, 5% 5 of people doing it, 95%, you know, at a really high standard. And we had, we'd rather have 95% of people doing it and getting it about 50% right so councils know what kinds of assets they're getting. The first one's not meant to be flippant. It's actually, um, it's just that it's easier than the organisational stuff, the collaboration, the, um, it's not really uh, easy to change a whole industry in a fairly short amount of time to get them to do something that's really quite new. I mean, water sensitive urban design, stormwater, it's fairly new. It's still, I mean, I don't think we should be thinking that it's been around for a long time, why haven't we got it right? It's, you know, we've been building sewers and drains for thousands of years. Um, not, not sewers, but drains. Um, and, and roads for, you know, thousands of years. So, of course, we've got those. We're getting, we're getting pretty good at those. Um, we're talking about bioretention, but our oldest one in, in Queensland is about 15 years old. It's not, it's not a long time, so we're still learning all the time. Um, I love that quote. Um, that's Jack Welch, who is the CEO of General Electric. Um, I don't agree with it necessarily, but I just think it's a good, it's a good, it's a good quote from, from that kind of organisation. And that's kind of what we saw happening in Queensland. So, um, so our policy in Queensland was driving, um, is driving still, um, 
quite a lot of infrastructure that, it, that is compliant with the targets. So the targets are these load reduction objectives and the, the, the outcome from that is infrastructure that delivers that. Now that's obviously really logical, but we were actually hoping for a bit more. So you can get infrastructure that delivers that, that's a basin in the corner of a development that doesn't add any other value. I don't think anybody here would really want that, but of course that's a completely logical outcome for a lot of people because all we need to comply with is the targets. Um, so we, we do get wetlands, tanks sometimes, even we get tanks particularly in um, body corporate, um, and we get some swales. Brisbane City Council have a campaign called Save the Swale. Um, I like that because um, swales, are, swales are tricky to do and they're tricky to do well, but when they're done well, they're a very effective sort of widget in water sensitive urban zone. Um, we get really good results on big developments, almost always actually, really good results because it's, because it's easy to integrate. It's the small stuff that's really challenging. Um, so on, on sort of a townhouse, this is kind of a typical outcome for a townhouse. It's not bad, like it's a little um, bar attention sort of out near the street, the, the, um, the townhouse development drains to it and it's okay. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a, a decent little landscape feature. Um, sometimes nothing happens at all. Um, becomes a bit of a driver for offsets, particularly in the small infill developments like the one hectare little subdivided blocks where they're going to put 10, 10 houses in there. That, that can be tricky to make it. So, well, people say that it's tricky. I'm not sure. It, 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 I suppose it can be. Um, it, certainly if you're not allowing really good streetscape stuff to happen, then building some sort of basin can be really tricky in a small development. I grant that. It's creating a driver for stormwater offsets in <coughs> Queensland. We're not allowed to call them offsets because we've got an offsets policy, but we're calling them offsite solutions. So just so you get with the, get with the Queensland lingo because the... Um, Faded, the faded curtain crowd don't like calling them offsets. Um, the, um, at the neighbourhood scale, so in, in the larger developments, actually most of the time it's really good, to be honest, because you have teams. I think it's because you have a team of people that are assembled. So the outcomes on big developments are usually quite good, I must say. Sometimes not so good, but, but usually good. Sometimes integrated with parks. Um, I reckon integrating stormwater really well into parks is a really good idea. Um, I'm not saying that it's easy, but it, it's a very good idea. We wrote a discussion paper and then came up with a framework some years ago. Um, um, I think it's a good idea because you can make, it, it can add value to the parks, um, as long as you don't diminish the other, qual the other qualities that those parks need to deliver, or the other services those parks need to deliver, so it's quite, it can be quite, quite tricky. Um, but I think that it, it can achieve all those things if it's done really well. Um, and this is one outcome in, in, in Brisbane um, that was achieved. And I, I think it's great. I mean, that park floods, so the water gets right up to here. So it completely floods. And that's, a, that's actually, I think that photo's taken before it flooded, but it was okay. It was, just a, bit, it was a bit dirty and they had to hose off pathways and stuff, but it was, it was fine otherwise. Um, and that's, that's only in a fairly big flood. Um, so that's the kind of outcomes you can achieve. And the problem is nobody wants them. That, that's, I think that's the, the problem that we have, that actually nobody wants to take these assets on in the end, because it's like, it's not a drainage thing, it's not an engineering thing, is it a parks thing, is it a land, is it a natural areas thing? Nobody really wants it, so that's the problem. So I don't think it is a technical problem to deliver it, I think there's lots of really clever people that can integrate engineering, landscape design, um, safety, um, everything, I think that can all be done. Um, there's lots of clever people around, we don't lack for that, we lack for people understanding and having the right organisational sort of framework or setup that they can actually manage it. Um, and it's also about providing developers some credit too. I mean, if they do a really good job and they integrate uh, uh, stormwater management, say, into a park really well, so it adds value to the park, they probably sh they should get some credit for that. Um, in other words, they should get a reduction in their park contribution or something, as long as they do it well. Um, there is, that's being developed into some policy at the moment in Queensland, so I'll be really interested to see uh, how that gets, if that gets taken up. So we, we, um, we learned a lot. I mean, implementation teaches you an awful lot, you know, that learning by doing thing. You know, you, you, you'd learn when stuff's happening and, you know, potentially billions of dollars worth of infrastructure over 20 years has been created. Um, you learn pretty quickly. Um, I, we, we'll provide the slides later, so um, I, think, I think I don't want to go on. Um, oh, yeah, I did want to say, the objectives that we have are driving bar attention. So if you don't want bar attention, I, I, I think bar attention is great actually, I really like bar attention, but in Queensland bar attention is a bit unpopular because there's been a couple of bad examples. Now most of the time it gets built really well, but there's a couple of, t not a, there's a few times it gets built 
maybe it gets built poorly, planned poorly, designed poorly, particularly behind a vessel block wall. Nobody wants to see that. Then, then people say, look, that's wussed. I don't like it. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. This is another great quote. I like it a lot. Winnie. Um, and, that, and, that's, and you, you can also learn a lot by looking at results. So this is, I call this the wussed wave. This is not happy. Um, and that's a bioretention base. And, and if those of you who know Typha, you shouldn't be Typha in a bioretention base and it's supposed to be dry. So that one, that, that failed. But people say, well, oh, that's wussed. See what's happening. We don't like it. And they're like, well, no, that's not, that's a flood basin, actually, that someone's put a bioretention basin in the bottom of and they haven't thought about sediment during construction because no, because it's 5% compliance. And it's ruined the bioretention basin and nobody's bothered to maintain it. So that's what's happened. It's not wussed. This is a, an organisational arrangement problem. Um, um, the big one, it costs too much. That's a really interesting one. I find that quite interesting. What do you mean it costs too much? If you tack it on, and if, if you consider not doing anything at all, like flood management costs a lot, would well, we not do that? Let's not do flood management. Oh no, you can't, you can't not do flood management because people get flooded. Okay, so you can't, why can't you do water quality as well? Oh, because it's sort of optional really. You know, that, that's the thinking. Um, um, so that does, that cost, that cost does um, create a lot of um, the, the cost pressure, actually, the, the price signal that water sensitive urban design is sending the industry um, because it's considered a tack on is a, is a problem. Um, and so that's why integrating is, is really important. So, there, there's, so the political pressure comes from the perceived impact on housing price. Now, the, the, actual, the actual housing price problem in Australia is because houses are so big. That's, that's really, I think that's all I'll say about that. It's, the houses are getting really large. That's what's causing housing. Shortage of land is one thing, so land is getting more expensive. Um, and also housing size, so houses are really big. They're, the, they're probably the two, it's not water sensitive urban design. We'll said costs about 1% of the, pro of the cost of a new house at the, at the most. So that's about two, or two square metres, two or three square metres of a house. So the question is, do you need the butler's pantry? You know, or, the, or you can have your media room half the size, or so, I don't know, something. Um, so, so for me, the, the cost thing is a bit of a, I reckon that's a, a I reckon it's a myth. There's a cost, there's a cost, but it's not a big cost, and it's certainly, when it's really well integrated, we found that, we found that you actually get three times the benefit of the investment. So we did a business case, um, and most business cases find that, but nobody believes business cases, even though they're analysed by economists. So um, a real pressure is that the community don't like these really ugly things that get built. Um, and that's actually a problem that, that even if there's one somewhere, people point at it and then that can create a driver for a councillor to say, I don't want this anymore. Um, so we did a, it, um, the council of mayors um, in Queensland did a big review. The, their program is called DA Process Reform Review of um, Operational Works in Large Subdivisions and it was shortened to Dapper L. So I found, I found this picture online because um, he looked like a Dapper L to me. Um, um, because I think otherwise it makes a really horrible, and again, a really horrible eight letter acronym a bit more interesting. Um, and what we found, in, in short, what we found was that um, a lot of the RFI requests for information that councils were sending out on development were related to stormwater. Actually, a lot of them were related to flooding, so it wasn't necessarily stormwater quality. Um, but they were finding a lot of, actually, the really interesting thing, they were finding a lot of tension. So they were reviewing the emails, so they reviewed emails and finding council people writing to developers or to the consultants and quite a lot of aggro. It was, it was really, and that's probably one of the main things that was causing, potentially causing bad outcomes, that there wasn't a good relationship. There, wa there wasn't the proper conversation happening. Um, I know that that's hard too, but I'm just, that was something that they observed. And there was a perception that 10% of the yield, you now developers, it's really important for a developer. So that if, they're, if they're being told you're gonna to lose 10% of the yield by doing this, that, that's, they really respond to that. They don't necessarily look into why that is, but they just, they'll respond and say, we don't, want to, we don't want to do it. So that's something we learned. We have to quickly respond to that perception that there's a loss of yield because there isn't necessarily a loss of yield at all if it's well designed. Um, I think I mentioned that. I wanted to mention this briefly. I know it seems a bit random to talk about rain gardens in Ishtafan, but um, there's a reason I want to mention it because, um, so the, this is, these are rain gardens that were built um, some 400 years ago. 
And I saw on, a, on another blog, this is a while ago, I, I, found, I found this, this comment on a blog, I found this so interesting. So does the local council, the question is asked, if you, those of you who can't read, the question is asked, does, it, does the local council do anything about maintenance? What do they do? What's their, what's their regime? And the response was, don't really know what their regime is, but they've been around for 400 years, so probably, probably it's okay. And I think, for me, that was a really, we spend a lot of time going, oh, the maintenance, it's gonna, it's gonna destroy us. It's gonna be millions of dollars. It's gonna, you know, there's this, there's this kind of worry. And it's like a really well-designed, constructed, and, and kind of observed and, and inspected system won't, won't require a lot of maintenance. It'll require some, but so do garden beds. So I, I, I see, oh, look at the rain garden. It's, co it's not, not, it looks horrible. It's not, not getting maintained. You got, there's a garden bed, there's a regular garden bed. It's not getting maintained either. So it's a problem with the organisations. It's not WUSID or not stormwater management. Okay, I, I couldn't not talk about hipsters. Um, um, so hipsters, for those of you who don't know how, they, how, how a hipster culture works, it's like there's things you like, there's things I like, and anything you like, I'm not going to like that anymore. That's, that's, how, that's how that works. Because um, I like a Venn diagram too, so there's a few coming. Now, best practice. So then I started to think about this. So, so who would have thought hipsters are really across best practice? Um, so this is not how, what you'd see, how you'd see best practice defined in a textbook, but it's how I've kind of observed it over the last few years. So best practice is things I've done before, things that have worked, yep, that's it. And that's what we keep doing. So we're going to keep doing that because we've done it before, it worked. And, and work depends on who you are. Like work, work for me might be different to work for you. Um, work for me might be um, not a really good outcome. So um, this is a drain. This is near where, um, in Townsville, near where my grandmother lives. So we've, we used to do this, and this used to be okay. This used to be best, best practice. There's, a, there's habitat. There's a cat there. It's hard. <laughs> So it's, it's habitat, there's wildlife. Um, but that's perfectly acceptable. I've seen that in a flight, it works. It drains the water, it's, it's effective. Um, um, and we, what we used to do is we actually used to take money from developers to contribute to a scheme that then councils would do stuff. What I'm, you know, it was really hard to do. So we went, oh, it was hard to plan the projects, deal with it. So then what we did is we decided we'd do this water sensitive urban design, which was kind of local, stormwater management, at source, it's all very good. It's, 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 it's bringing it all back, bring it back to the people, so to speak. Um, the problem is that that was actually really hard to do. Um, so what we did is we go, oh, let's do best practice stormwater. So we go, okay, the design meets the guidelines. We build it well because we have, we have guidance for that too. We, um, the asset gets maintained, perfect. That's what we want. Um, one, one um, I, I like this image too because this, we said we, we have a design, right? So this is what we want. We want, we want people to walk over here and we want them to walk through there and they're going to go over there. People don't do that. <laughs> they do that. <laughs> That's what they do. So you, we need to respond to how people behave. I mean, it's not, we can't make them do stuff that we, we, we really, we, we want them to do that, they're going to do that. So we have to realise that. Um, so then we get that. Right, so that's what happens sometimes. And that probably, to be honest, meets everything in the guidelines. Right, so that's a huge flood retention basin. It's got the boat ramp for maintenance access to get the tyres out. Um, it's got, the, the walls are no more than say 600 millimetres high. It's all, it's all good, it's, it meets all the guidelines. But do you want that? I don't know, I mean, I don't want that. Um, that also meets the guidelines, I think, I don't know how. Um, there's a maintenance track over here, see there's a maintenance track. It's, I mean, how many gabion baskets are there? It's just, yeah, yeah, so, um, and that's new. That's new. So the, 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 it's not water sensitive urban design that's created that, it's flood detention. So that's flood detention crammed into a small amount of area. That's part of water sensitive urban design, of course, because flood management's part of it, but it's not the stormwater quality causing that. The stormwater quality bit's this bit here that's been chucked in the bottom. So that's been full of water in a flood and it kind of works and it charges water out through a pipe into the creek and erodes the creek, but um, it does its job as it's intended to do. So what, what do we actually want? We probably want, we probably want those things. We want, we want the economics of, of a project to stack up. We want the community to love it. And we want it to be, to be the environment to be protected. So we should do that. Um, and we get those kinds of outcomes. Um, so that's a council project um, and, and in a retrofit situation. And the community, the local community really love that. 
So we learnt that compliance doesn't drive necessarily the right outcomes. So people don't always do what we expect them to do. We want people to think more broadly. So then we needed to get into our final phase where we, we actually adapt. We actually have to change our focus from being compliance driven to a bit broader. Um, and Ken Robinson, for those of you who know Ken, he's an incredibly inspirational speaker. I really recommend you check him out. Um, so what, we tried, what we've tried to do more recently in the last few years is we've tried to, particularly the last 18 months, is we've tried to get people to think a bit, bit broader and bigger than just water quality and just flooding. Just, just broaden their minds a bit. And so we developed this project. So I, just check it out online if you want. Um, um, and we've set some broader principles they're, and, and maybe objectives you'd call them. And then we created a framework that sits underneath it where you get points. So this is where the incentive part comes in. So you can actually, now we're not a body, we're not a, regular, we're not a regulator, we can't make anyone do this, but we can put it out there. So what we do is we put stuff out there to the world and we see if people like it. Um, and we try to influence people that way. And councils are starting to pick this up, developers are starting to pick it up, or their consultants, and they're starting to try to use it and figure out how to, how to make it work for them. And another thing we're trying to be a lot less prescriptive, so our guidelines, for those of you who have seen our guidelines, they're very, they were in the past very prescriptive. We've tried to just give people ideas now, more and more we're just trying to say, here's, here's an idea. Why don't you try that? And we go, oh yeah, okay, I'd, I'd like to try that. And then they just kind of off a sketch, they can kind of make it work. Some of the best things I've seen built have been built off a, off a sketch, at least initially. Um, we, yeah, there's, there's a, a big movement in Queensland towards off-site solutions, so stormwater offsets. N naughty word, but um, um, it's very challenging. I mean, offsets are going to be a part of our, a part of our system in the future, but it's very challenging. Just like the infrastructure planning was before, delivering councils, delivering a, a, a range of projects is going to be really hard. Um, that's, that's my main message for that one. Um, we're, we've got a big emphasis now on erosion and sediment control because it's such a big problem and it's ruining a lot of our good stormwater quality assets. Um, we're, doing, we're working with the state government on um, an update to stormwater policy. We're getting funded by the state government to do this erosion and sediment control project. I've put the information in the slides just so that um, you, you can check them out later if you want. But um, that's a very big problem for us and it sounds like it's a bit of a problem here in, in South Australia too. Um, so part of it's a business case, but a lot of it's working with local government to help build the capacity. Not teaching them how to go and do inspections, but actually trying to figure out ways to influence their political masters too, that this is a really good idea for them to do. There's a very good business case for them to manage this, this problem a lot better. Um, we're actually working with the state government at the moment, working on, the, on stormwater objectives. Um, very challenging, trying to create a, an environment, trying to create objectives that drive um, avoidance strategies um, f through music modelling. It's very hard to do that. Um, so we've been trying but to, to do that, but um, es essentially what we're going to have is load reduction objectives and another system to help us drive um, other, other behaviour. So, wrapping up. Um, I reckon we're doing a lot of things um, really quite well. There's a couple of bad examples and they can really start to you know, be an, a real irritant to people who make decisions. So we have to be prepared for those irritants and try to address them, do some myth busting. So we often get out, people go, oh, you can't put trees in bioretention, it won't work. So we go out and we go, all right, well, let's look at some of the really old bioretention systems, put cameras in the drainage and see if there's a problem. And there isn't. So we said, no, that's not a problem. And trees are really good because they reduce maintenance, because they shade out weeds. Um, just that's just one example. Um, we really try to find out what drivers are away from water sensitive urban design. We try to bring people back by, by kind of trying to dispel those myths. Um, and I think I've mentioned this a few times now, but the political will is, um, so for those of you who are not in local government, think about the people in local government and need to respond to councillors and stuff as well. So try to think about things that, that are gonna help them sell this message to, um, to their masters. Um, and we've found actually that leading with some good ideas, even though we don't have any real authority, we can actually come out with some good ideas and then the state government and local governments pick them up. If it's a good idea, it'll get, people will pick it up eventually. It just might take time. Like the, the, um, the park, the integrated pu public open space stuff is five years old. So it took a number of years for anyone to really pick that up and, and, t and do anything with it. Um, and the last thing is partnerships are really important. Um, and that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.